That's great. Thank right. you, Diane. Can you all sit? Yeah, I am. Cool. Appreciate it. See the other mic. I have the other mic. Oh, you do. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, good. All right. Um, all right. So thanks everyone for being here, and we're going to get going so we stay on time. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure for me to um, be able to introduce Adam Leventhal. Um, he is the a uh, professor of preventive medicine at um, USC. So he's traveled a long way to be here with us today, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, Adam, at least from my perspective, is still um, pretty early in his career. He is about 11 years um, beyond his uh, PhD. He uh, did his undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara and um, in psychology and then from there went to um, the University of Houston where he um, got his PhD in clinical psychology and from there off to Brown for both internship and then a postdoc. And some of you um, are familiar with Brown's really accomplished um, postdoctoral training program. And I, my um, sense of it is um, clinical psychologists in particular have really thrived in that program and go on to do um, wonderful things. And Adam is, is, is a great example of that. So he uh, went from Brown to um, USC and has just zoomed through the uh, ranks and is now, as I mentioned at the start, a professor um, and has been really accomplished during that time which accounts for the accelerated uh, movement, and that he has um, 200 publications. He um, has had numerous uh, grant awards, NIH grant awards is on NIH study sections, um, all of which tell you what his peers um, think about him. Um, and one of the things that really stands out to me is how much he has been recognized in the form of national awards. Um, and there, on his CV, there are seven um, awards for early career contributions. And if you want to look at convergence of evidence, there it is. And, um, and these have spanned uh, the College on Problems of Drug Dependence, the Society for Research on Nicotine Tobacco, um, three different divisions of American Psychological Association plus a, a, um, an association-wide um, award for early career scientific contributions. So, you know, it just gives you a sense of, of just um, all the wonderful things that Adam's doing. And then um, relatively recently, Adam was um, appointed as a member of the National Academy of Sciences um, panel to review um, e-cigarettes, which obviously is a, a really important and hot topic these days. So again, to be on that kind of panel this era in his career really says a lot about the quality of work he does, and it's certainly a topic um, that we're very interested in here at the uh, Vermont Center on, on um, Behavior and Health, and especially in our tobacco work. Uh, so Adam, uh, please, well, help me welcome Adam, um, who is going to be telling us about his e-cig research. Thank you, Steve. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I probably don't even need this mic. Um, that was, like, the nicest introduction I've ever had. Thank you, and it's an honor, you know. Um, like many of us, uh, Steve was one of my research idols in grad school, um, and, and Tim Baker and other uh, great people. So it's just it's really um, it's really gratifying uh, to you know get the recognition from you, and it's wonderful to be uh, here. 
I love Burlington. Uh, I love the people as part of this group. They're really nice individuals, and they keep on getting nicer with additions like Allison um, and uh, Andrea. So, um, yeah. All right. Well, so today I'm going to talk about my uh, eSig uh, research, and it's, it's a little different than some of the work I've presented here before. Um, but we're really going to hone in on regulatory science and address this critical question about what's the public health impact of vaping, how can we regulate it, <clears throat> and how can we find a common ground uh, where we're not just thinking about, well, let's restrict them or let's be permissive. And so that's what this, uh, this talk is about. So first, I'm going to talk about a brief history of uh, e-cigarettes and uh, <clears throat> kind of where they came from. And the, even though the history is brief, a lot has happened. Uh, then I'll talk about some of the regulatory tools in this, per this uh, precision framework, this precision regulation fr framework that I'm going to, to present. Then I'll talk about prevalence patterns and health effects uh, with a focus on comparing across different populations who might uh, experience different health effects of e-cigarettes. And then uh, go into some regulatable reasons. And that's not, I guess, uh, you can't find regulatable in the dictionary, but I think it should be, right? Um, so, and when we think about mechanisms and causes and reasons for use, it's from a, a regulation uh, framework and a policy framework, it's good to think about those that are regulatable. And then uh, just, I'll talk about some implications uh, towards the end. So uh, I think this, so 2010 is a good starting point, right? Because e-cigarettes didn't start becoming popular until after then. Uh, and w I guess I think the enthusiasm for e-cigarettes from the public health community comes from data like this. This is from the National Health Interview Survey of smokers in 2010. And uh, you can see uh, most of them want to quit. Half of them made a quit attempt. Not that many used an intervention, and then uh, very few used a, uh, a medication, including over-the-counter products like nicotine replacement, even though they're easy to get, sometimes publicly subsidized, um, and, uh, and fairly inexpensive. So what's the problem with, uh, with your traditional nicotine replacement if you're um, trying to quit smoking? Well, there's two problems. One. Uh, if we think about why people might not find traditional nicotine replacement appealing uh, and may not stick with it, if you think about the pharmacokinetics of the drug delivery, this is a, uh, th these are data from four different forms of nicotine administration. The, uh, the top one is uh, traditional cigarettes, which are through the pulmonary route, just like e-cigarettes. Um, <clears throat> And then you have uh, different types of nicotine replacement products. So what do you notice about the graphs? This is the time course, and this is the plasma nicotine. Well, yeah, right. But yeah, and one stands out, right? And so we know abuse liability is determined by the level of drugs in your blood and how quickly it hits, right? And so cigarette clearly wins. So uh, if you're not doing a good job mimicking the cigarettes, then if you have a choice and you, you know, your motivation or conditions to quit aren't super strong, then you're going to choose uh, the cigarettes, unfortunately. But the, this, this is one of the things I love about uh, uh, nicotine research, is that nicotine is not just the actual nicotine in your blood, which makes a huge difference. Um, it does. It makes an important difference but also the, the sensory stimuli associated with the nicotine self-administration ritual, the sensations in your lungs, the smell, the taste, the behavior, all those are critical. And what happens is they become conditioned uh, stimuli and conditioned re uh, reinforcers over time as you pair them with nicotine. And then this beautiful paper, uh, a really good review paper, you should check it out right there, um, 
basically elegant animal evidence and stuff that explains the human evidence that we see that there's basically a synergistic interaction between the uh, primary reinforcing effects of nicotine and how nicotine acts as a reinforcement enhancer for um, other non-pharmacological reinforcers and the most common non-pharmacological reinforcers would be like the sensations of, of smoking. But you think about nicotine makes the good thing better, right? And so the two uh, synergize to make combustible cigarettes so unbelievably addictive and probably differentiate uh, to a certain degree why most nicotine replacement products are not. So what if there was a less toxic product that delivered nicotine and sensory stimuli just like a cigarette, um, but it wasn't as harmful? Wouldn't that be great? So I think you know where I'm going with this. So the e-cigarette. All right, so uh, definition. You have to have a definition, I think, for this emerging class and this heterogeneous class. So and we use the term vaping. Uh, so it's the act of inha inhaling an aerosol produced by heating a substance to the point of aerosolization, but lower than combustion. So the substance doesn't get lit on fire. And um, you can see that the word nicotine is not in there because this is a process, a method of administration. So you can vaporize cannabis. You can probably vaporize other things. <clears throat> um, and if you don't have combustion, then you're going to take away, in theory, a lot of the toxins. And so, oh, I mean, e-cigs, vaporizer, pod moths, dueling, vape pen, whatever, e-hookahs, there's a million terms. But it, the common theme is uh, the, uh, the vaping or aerosolization process, I think, which ties them all together. And the drug, of course. So e-cigarettes have evolved quite a bit. Um, over the years. So, uh, so e-cigs 1.0, cig uh, they look like cigarettes, right? So most e-cigarettes on the market look like that. And for multiple reasons, uh, growth of the marketplace, new companies, and just evolution of culture, and just how things happen. It's a really interesting phenomenon how um, I think new classes of, of drugs of abuse catch uh, popularity. Um, and, you know, so this has the uh, backing of also a legalized, uh, you know, substance and, uh, you know, uh, marketing and, and uh, manufacturing. So anyway, the, what happened is all these evolutions, they become larger, they have embellishments, um, higher power, they're customizable. And so they don't look like cigarettes anymore. And then some people will tell you who vape. They will say, I don't use e-cigarettes. I vape, though. Like, oh, OK. So sometimes people think e-cigarettes are cigalikes. But, but you know, the same uh, mechanism. We get sweet flavors. And so a lot of the e-cigarettes on the market at first didn't have, they were unflavored, actually, in um, uh, mainly tobacco or menthol. So now all sorts of interesting flavors. And then also nicotine-free. And so people actually wanting just to, the experience of vaping without the nicotine some of them might have been people who have transitioned from smoking, uh, but uh, a fair number of them are youth who just like, I think it's cool to blow a big cloud and like uh, the whole culture. All right, so that's 2.0, not equivalent to second generation, I'm calling, but I'm calling 2.0. And then, so 3.0, uh, pod mods. Um, they involve nicotine salt formulation uh, and this is really, I think, a huge and, and a dish, just as significant of a shift as we saw from Sigalikes to this kind of vaporizers and tanks. We're seeing it now again, a third major uh, evolutionary era. So they're high tech, you know, as you guys, some of you guys might know, they look like USB drives. Um, they're small, uh, they're simple, so not all. There's no digital display on the device, no like uh, levers or uh, um, dials to change power settings and other things like a vaping connoisseur who uses a tank would do. Um, these are more kind of like the iPhone, right? Like anybody can use them. You just you slide in the flavor pod, you have a few flavors, um, and then you're good to go. Make sure you're charged. Uh, they're discreet. So uh, you, you got vaporizers, big tank, huge cloud, right? Um, 
so most people using uh, Joule, <coughs> they're, uh, well, they're either a kid and they don't want people to know, or they just, they're not doing it to be part of vape culture. They want to do it because they like it. They, they're, maybe they're addicted, so just quick, like in their sleeve, you know, no, it looks like a flash drive. So it's a real change in culture, I think. Um, and then uh, I guess a key thing that's overlapping, not fully redundant with, but overlapping, is the, uh, <coughs> I'm going to plug in this drive, is the, uh, the change in the formulation. Okay, And this is really interesting. And um, I tried to do some reading on it because they're so new, these nicotine salt formulations. And then also uh, Tom Eisenberg gave us a talk, so that never hurts because he knows all about this stuff. Um, so basically, the idea is, is that uh, standard nicotine is in freebase form, and that's what you see in e-cigarettes. Um, and uh, but nicotine salts occur naturally. It's a different chemical formulation where I guess the salt is attached. Um, so let me just turn this off. Um, what does that amount to? Basically, it amounts to a different sensory effect where there's less uh, of a gustatory taste. If you jack up nicotine freebase, it gets bitter, and then. Um, it might change the, the experience of it. Um, but ironically, at the same time, I think that nicotine salts are less permeable to the blood-brain barrier or in terms of cells. So um, pound for pound, a nicotine freebase is going to have a bigger effect. But the main thing with the nicotine salt is that you can jack it up higher, and then people won't go like, ugh, what is that? Right? Which they'll do if you give them a 50 milligram nicotine solution and you uh, give them in a big, powerful tank, they'll just like hate it, right? So, uh, so I think that my judgment, and when I read the, um, their, the company's data, that the pharmacokinetic profile is higher, uh, quite a bit higher. So even though it's like two to 10 times higher than your average, in terms of nicotine concentration, than your average free base, the, um, maybe the net yield to like a really powerful device would be not on that magnitude, maybe less, but still significant because there's such a high nicotine concentration. And um, I think that also explains why they're so small. They don't need as powerful of a battery to deliver bioactive nicotine. It's okay if some of it gets deposited in your, your throat. So anyway, um, for all these various reasons, kind of a different product subclass and then um, different reasons for use, I think. Uh, okay, so the retail environment has changed quite a bit. Uh, so you got cigarettes, right? You buy them from a convenience store, and then you don't want people to know you smoke. You go outside because you can't smoke, right? And so you discreetly, um, and you've got to hop back in. But uh, the uh, environment and culture is quite different with vaping, that it, it could be celebrated. Um, we got vape shops. We got e-juices, and the reason I show these, they're artisanal e-juices, so much like a wine connoisseur, maybe a coffee connoisseur, um, you know, you have uh, vaping and e-liquid connoisseurs. You got your vape tricks. There we go. Yeah, so uh, that's totally different. Um, if anyone can do that with their cigarette smoke, I'll be really impressed. Um, this then, yeah, the word vaping basically is a new word, so it's... That's, uh, Interesting. And then um, advocacy groups, pro. Um, hey, there's not that many smoking advocacy groups anymore, right? We're having someone else's feed really, um, into well our. Celebrated. But advocacy groups has been, there? and grassroots has been really important <laughs> in the public perception of vaping and, um, I guess, other uh, socio political forces. So it's just totally different. And then, and then jeweling. So this, there's been a bunch of articles on jeweling lately. Like the reporters are way ahead of the researchers. Like some of us know, but you know. We've got to get funded and do our multi-year grants. So by the time we publish, then they'll have a new product. But, um, but anyway, so these are kids jeweling in class. Yeah. And then I get asked by high schools to talk to, that, to their kids about jeweling. Um, but then they end up wanting to talk about marijuana. So I think that's probably another, like, is marijuana bad for you? It's, just, it's the same 
it's a similar but even more complex regulatory dilemma because it may even have therapeutic properties. Um, it's not just like a lower harm agent. But anyway, um, and then so uh, totally different. Like I guess any product in today's day and age is that working? It's video. Oh. Oh well. Well, basically, this is just a video, and it shows you uh, that if you want to get a, an e-cigarette, it's really not hard. You just click on 18, and then you can go onto the um, the a Twitter handle for a popular um, uh, e-cigarette brand, and then you can learn about it. And so, just the marketing is whole, totally different because of social media and the internet. And so, e-cigarettes have evolved during this era, and then you know, cigarettes can't do these things because of the regulations. Um, okay, so now you, have, you know the, the history of e-cigarettes and where they came from. Um, and basically, they're not just smoking reduction devices in and of themselves. That's not like a, a good way to think of them. But they can be, but that's not only what they are. So, uh, so talking about this precision uh, regulation framework, uh, you know, the Family Prevention and Tobacco Control Act did a lot. It gave the FDA authority to regulate tobacco products. And I think it's a huge game changer for uh, you know tobacco control, as probably many of you all agree, even if you disagree with how fast they work or what precisely they're doing. It's just it's I think it's a big um, it's a big plus. And so they have tools like product standards. Product standards are very powerful because what they can do is they can say a product with certain types of characteristics or even like the way it's marketed on its package design. Say like, oh, well, we're not going to allow people to sell those products anymore because we've judged that they have a harm uh, to the population. Pre-market review, so you got to, if you're a new product, eventually you'll have to um, go through FDA's approval process like other products uh, they regulate. Modified risk claims, you can't just say light anymore um, uh, because uh, you need to prove it, basically, if you want to use some terms like that. And then reduced nicotine, which you guys know about, I mean, Probably, in my opinion, I think that that goes through. That oh, that'll be the biggest thing in tobacco control, and we'll end smoking in three generations. My personal opinion. Um, so huge. And then FDA. This took them a while, but then they said basically e-cigarettes are tobacco products, and so are hookah, and maybe other products they weren't regulating. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, and then, so you could actually buy cigarette. You could buy e-cigarettes as a minor in certain states, even like in 2015. Um, there's a good paper which shows like how the states, you know, like most of them you could buy an e-cigarette in 2009, and then if you were under 18. So anyway, um, so they made a federal law, uh, and you know, photo ID, you know, vending machine sales, and then a lot of kind of talk in there in the deeming rule about kind of planting the seeds about what they might consider in the future for um, product standards and things. Uh, so, all right, <clears throat> now you're educated, I guess, a little bit more education, but uh, the population as a whole standard, I think, is critical to this whole piece. So the FDA, according to the Tobacco Control Act, they have to consider the risk and benefits to the population as a whole. So. Uh, any policies, they have to think about you know, the direct health effects um, and acute toxicity. Uh, they got to uh, also consider harm reduction, the extent to which a policy change will increase or reduce the probability that existing tobacco users will stop. And I guess an interpret a modern interpretation is uh, transitioning from a combustible to a lower harm non-combustible. Within this, and at the same time, non-users will start, which mainly we're concerned about young adults and, and kids. So, with e-cigarettes, that poses a dilemma. With traditional cigarettes, um, we can all agree that the harder they are to get, and the harder, um, uh, the less appealing they are. Like by taking away the nicotine addictive, um, it's all a good thing. There's no counterbalancing um, or opposing effects. But e-cigs. Uh, there are. So, and, you know, as I'll get into, but uh, basically, if, if, if they're recruiting youth into tobacco product use, but they're also helping smokers quit, and there's other effects. Like, how do you, um, 
how do you do it? How do you benefit the whole population? Since uh, vaping could s benefit some populations but harm others. Like, can we do that? Can we actually, like, have our cake and eat it, too? Some people, well, think you can, but I think you can. Or at least you can do a good job at trying to um, maximize this. And, you know, at the population level, this could ultimately sum to, like, two million lives if you can hit that sweet spot. Um, so kind of my, this is, this is just my, basically the way I think about the population impact and the population as a whole, is that, so you have the prevalence, and prevalence also includes kind of patterns, heaviness, and chronicity, um, times the health effects leads to the population impact. But when you have vaping, the prevalence uh, times the health effects in the overall population isn't a, um, uh, a detailed enough equation because the health effects vary, they're moderated by the subpopulation. And so as I'm talking about youth non-smoker versus an adult smoker, youth could have differing opposing effects um, on health. So if we can understand population-specific prevalence uh, health effects and regulatable reasons for use and the health effects, then maybe we can um, identify those which will hit that sweet spot. And then I'm also going to apply this later to vulnerable populations, not just adolescents um, or other forms of population diversity. Um, and just so, as we've been talking about FDA, because a lot of us have been thinking about um, federal regulatory science, but there's also non-FDA um, policies. And FDA does other things besides regulate. They educate the public and have uh, public service announcements and things like that. So, and these are very powerful, too. Uh, so I wish I had more data to talk about, um, or more time to talk about these. But. All right, so the first question in the equation is like prevalence, basically, and then health effects. So, uh, so prevalence, like who's vaping? All right, so here is data um, from 2015 NHIS, National Health Interview Survey. Um, so you can see that there's an inverse relationship between age and uh, prevalence of e-cigarettes. So it tends to be more popular in younger adults than older adults. Um, and, uh, you know, and we need, so we need to understand why that's the case. And we'd expect that, especially older people who've been smoking for a long time, stand to benefit quite a bit um, from quitting smoking. All groups do, but you know that's the ones we tr we are typically thinking about. The people who couldn't have quit by any other means, they've tried stuff. Um, and then we want to say, like, here's a new product, like, don't give up hope. Uh, but they're not using it as much. And then uh, you got to think about so population heterogeneity and and smoking status. Uh, so you can see amongst those who are using e-cigarettes in the National Health Interview Survey, the middle uh, and older adult current vapors are more likely to have been transitioners who are former smokers. Um, and then a fair amount of them are, uh, well, a lot of them are dual users, too. And that's just common with vaping, uh, particularly amongst adults. Uh, and then when you go to the young adults, the 18 to 24, they're, uh, you can see that they're more likely to have been never smokers. And I should say never smokers means less than 100 cigs in this definition. And so probably some of them took a few puffs or might have you know, smoked at parties uh, from uh, time to time, but they were never regular smokers. So that has implications if they were never at risk to have, if they were really at low risk by uh, not having initiated regular smoking by then, then they don't stand to benefit, presumably, from vaping, whereas the other people certainly uh, do. Uh, so conversion rate. So I made up a lot of equations, and these aren't like scientifically validated, but I think they simplify ways to think about this, because there's a lot of epi data, and maybe I got a little too deep into it. But um, so conversion rate from ever to current use, right? And so if we want to get people on a lower harm product, or we want to prevent people from using any, well, we want to prevent initiation, and we also want to prevent or promote transitions or escalation becoming a regular user. And so if you look at the age uh, differences, like overall the conversion is fairly low. Um, I guess the conversion rate for smoking 
might be uh, maybe a third I saw in a recent study, or maybe even more. Um, but the people who become uh, current or regular users. Well, this is just current use. Uh, and, but then you can see the older people, they try it, but they don't, they're not interested. It's, uh, about 7% of them who have tried it become regular users. And then I try to get more data and like what is regular use and then daily use. And uh, it's hard to, to kind of get the data um, to look at these nuances. But basically, daily use is, is very rare overall across the board amongst all the age groups. Um, and then PodMod products, we think, I think, will change it if they're more addictive and appealing. Um, the anecdotal reports is are, are that if you try it, you're much more likely to say, hey, this is a nice buzz, or like, wow. Or even smokers will be like, wow, that's, that's, this is a good throat hit, right? And it's the same, like, I guess, weight of a cigarette, too, or not that far off. So it feels less foreign. So uh, with kids, you can see that it's a, a different scenario. Basically, the um, current use past 30 day is a lot higher overall amongst high school students than all the uh, other age brackets. And then uh, there's an escalation. And then it went down in 2016, so that's really good. Um, but yeah, it might change. I'm monitoring the future is showing some kind of bounce back um, in their 2017 data. So, but I think it's, I like the NYTS. Uh, so it would be interested to see what, what happens there with new products like Juul and if they can adequately assess them too. People say, oh, I don't vape, I Juul. So we're always trying to. Um, Keep up, but uh, and so here's patterns of use, uh, and basically the point. This is the best data I could find is from 2014 NYTS, is because it's really hard to get like detailed frequency data. But basically, I think that this the cigarette curves are shifted to the right in terms of like heaviness amongst the current users, and what you see is about half of them are like like really light users, one to two days out of the past month. And then you know it gets progressively lower uh, between weekly use and maybe two days a week, you know, three or four, and then it like it kicks back a little bit to all 30 days. So maybe that's a qualitatively unique group who are um, daily vapors. So it's there's kind of a distribution. What are the direct health effects? Okay, so now we understand basically the prevalence, and the health impact of the prevalence uh, is dependent on the health effects. So, uh, you know, we could spend like two hours talking about this, but the, this report, to summarize it, uh, the, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine consensus report last year. Um, no, this year, actually, is when it came out. E-cigarettes are not without risk, but when compared to combustible cigarettes, fewer toxicants can deliver nicotine in a similar manner, can, um, show significantly less biological activity in most, but not all in vitro animal and human systems. Um, and uh, they carry less abuse liability. And then I put a star there. Um, you have to qualify everything uh, with e-cigarettes because there's so many variations. But basically, all the product uh, variation, including nicotine concentrations, is going to differentiate abuse liability, of course, right? And maybe appeal um, and some of the other health effects. So, um, but if you look at the mean of all the products, like cigarettes are pretty, <laughs> it's a kurtotic, right, distribution, that most of them are just really bad for you. And then, you know, um, a lot more variation uh, in e-cigarettes. And those aren't really too dependent on population. There are some nuances, like kids and asthma and other things. But, but ben generally, the, just that's why we're interested in harm reduction, is because uh, we don't, we like you, we'd rather you be inhaling air, but vaping is going to, on average, be a lot less toxic to you and should definitely reduce risk of cancer. Um, health effects mediated by smoking cessation. All right, so this is the key thing, is that since cigarettes uh, and other combustibles are so bad for you and they account for all the tobacco health toll, um, you know, their direct health effects, their acute toxicity might pale in comparison to their impact by moving smoking uh, behavior around. So let's talk about cessation. And this is not like really good data. Um, this is a good meta-analysis. I liked it, uh, LDEP. Uh, 
And so basically there's a weak positive signal on RCTs, but they're old RCTs and probably maybe not representative. And then there's a bunch of cohort studies, longitudinal cohorts, which basically show a weak negative signal, like that it's associated with reduce. But then there's all sorts of confounds in the observational study. Um, and you know, maybe if you're just so dependent and you try anything to quit smoking, then you're destined to um, not quit. And there's other problems with these. But. Um, so I, the, to me, the, I really like this study, even though it's got old sigalikes. It was done in, um, uh, I think, New Zealand. Um, so these are the main outcomes. Uh, uh, this is like a survival, so con continuous abstinence. And you can see, like, basically, they, although they're very similar, um, but it seems, I think that there was either a trend or some small effect comparing the nicotine e-cigarettes to the placebo e-cigarettes. Um, and then the patches weren't different, I think, from either, but n not the not the not the uh, the nicotine e-cigarettes. So that's really important, right? It could be a type two error, but um, but probably maybe there was no differences. And but okay, so this I think is really important. And so when you really drill down to look at like what's going on, what underlies this outcome, um, you know, you guys do clinical trials, so you know that adherence is really critical in terms of mediating the effects. And that adherence can differ between two groups, um, you know, even a randomized controlled trial. So this is the adherence of these products at each of the different time intervals. And you can see that um, both the types of e-cigarettes, they're way more likely to be used in the patches. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's really important is that, so though they might have had similar outcomes, clinical outcomes, how they got there were probably different. And even one way to think about this is like efficacy um, versus reach in a way, but that maybe if you like made people like you, you have to vape, you have to use your patch, you might get even better outcomes for the patch, at least with these cigarettes in this population in 2011. Um, so anyway, so that's really important, and it's an, and it's I think overlooked with the uh, population impact. It's not just about like are they efficacious um, in a randomized trial. So uh, this was a really influential study uh, uh, by Xu Hong Zhu and colleagues with the uh, current population study. I forget what it's called, but it's like a massive study, and uh, you have enough power to look at trends over time. And basically, the point of this paper, um, which was really compelling, is that the cessation rate, the prevalence of people who had quit in the past, I think, 12 months um, successfully has been stable for many, many years, despite all of these new um, interventions and policies and taxes. And then you see this bump. Um, and then basically through a series of um, logical exercises and also some cross-sectional analyses, you can, uh, you can infer that probably a meaningful portion of the change was due to the arrival of e-cigarettes and their use and maybe even like better products that are, are more appealing and higher nicotine delivery. And so, but one of the things that I want to drill down, and I called Xu Hong to ask him about this, because I thought it was like really compelling, um, is that, so it's not that they're more, the, the quit success rate is not better with e-cigs, um, at least, you know, this broad definition. If you parse the ESIG groups, you might get better quit success rates if they're heavier users. But so the success ratio, right? Um, so uh, that ratio is uh, the same, basically, for ESIG users, former and then never ESIG users. So the, the, what they're really doing, if they're doing something on the broad population level, is they're encouraging more people to quit. And if you can't quit at all, if you don't even try, then there's no way you're going to quit, right? And so, you know, they could even, in theory, they could even, like, harm if you did a randomized controlled trial in e-cigs versus nothing, and, and you got lower abstinence rates in e-cigs. It doesn't matter, because in the population, if you're encouraging more people to quit, even if it's a really low success rate, you've moved the meter in the population. And then, you know, that's probably unlikely in terms of the efficacy, but I think probably the biggest public health impact and why the simulation studies are finding um, 
population gain, a year's life gain in simulations and models um, for uh, e-cigarettes, associated with e-cigarettes. This is the reason, mainly. Um, Okay, so then on the other side, uh, health effects mediated by smoking uptake. So here is uh, a study. Basically, uh, it shows that if you use e-cigarettes, you're more likely, if you're a kid who uses e-cigarettes and you never use a combustible tobacco product, over the next year, you're more likely to um, use uh, any type of tobacco product, be poly product users, cigarettes included, so these are adjusted odds ratios, control for all sorts of uh, variables. Still, you know, for causality, it's still an observational study, but do our best. Um, and then, uh, so that was this paper, and then, then this paper came out, then this paper came out, then this paper came out, this paper came out, this, anyway. So there's a lot of replications. There's 10, there's, no, I think 12 or 13 now. And so, like, this is obviously a robust association. Whether it's causal, I think that there's evidence to suggest it may be causal, um, which would be different than the population health impact, but just if you were to randomly assign kids to vape versus not vape, um, you might get more smoking rates um, before, so we can't do that. So uh, basically the inferences are that there's uh, substantial evidence that it could, you know, promote smoking. Uh, amongst youth. And then so we did this study. Basically, this study was about, um, we wanted to see whether, if not only they did they start smoking, but they did they actually progress um, to become regular smokers? Because if it's all just a bunch of experimenters, right, and then vaping just makes you want to try, but then you're actually less likely to become a regular user, then the public health impact is, is minimal. But anyway, this, this study shows the same, that you see a dose response um, these are unadjusted, but then you can adjust for baseline values. But you can see like this uh, s smoking uh, frequency variable or heaviness variable, which is a low threshold. And you see that there's like very few of them are smoking two plus more cigs per day, and that's a low threshold, um, which I think is just it's common. Like today's adolescents, there's not that many daily smokers. So we've been good at preventing them. But you can see that basically the more you vape. The more um, the higher odds you are to smoke at higher levels in the future. Okay, yeah. So there's the OR, and then we adjust for a bunch of covariates. So this is a short outcome, and then we had another uh, outcome like number of days smoked. So all right. Uh, so the public health impact of vaping. So there's benefits, which I kind of reviewed. You know, for adults, the the switching. There's harms, maybe, um, I don't know if there's evidence of this, but like that, but it's possible that the e-cigarettes could prevent people from quitting. Um, uh, you know, you, but you, you're sustaining an addiction to the extent to which like having nicotine in your brain all the time and in your body is bad. I think particularly for your brain, it could relate to psychiatric disorders um, or at least distress. Um, Secondhand exposure, and then the young people, right? And so the I'm kind of just going to throw away this, right? Because it implies this scale it implies that like you got to pick, you got to, right? So it's not just one dimension. All right, so let's talk about what are the regulatable reasons for use and the health effects across the populations, um, which we could tweak. Uh, so what do we want? We want um, Minimal direct health effects for all populations. We want minimal appeal to youth, and we want them, if they do use them, they don't promote transition to combustibles. We want maximum appeal to adults, um, uh, particularly if they actually promote quit attempts and success. Okay, and so this is the thing that's like tough. Abuse liability, nicotine concentration, stuff like that. It's gonna correlate with appeal um, and quit promotion in adults, but you know, addiction in kids, so. It's a hard one. Uh, nicotine, I don't know how, that's going to be a tough one to regulate, uh, uh, according to this framework. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and conversion to regular use. That's another thing we want to think about, is that if you got to be a regular user, which some uh, evidence suggests, to, to quit uh, using e-cigarettes, then 
we don't want just people to try and, and buy the product or take a taste from their friends. We want them to uh, become regular users. So um, here's some regular relatable reasons. And I'm going to like go through pretty fast because I'm going slow. Um, but basically, there's different types of devices. Some are more powerful and different. And then here's some good data. Basically, on the left is plasma increase from combustible cigarettes. And on the right is like one type of e-cigarette. And then the middle are other types of e-cigarettes. And even if you have a high concentration, if they're not powerful or don't have other characteristics, you may not get any nicotine yield. Or, but then you can also um, maybe equal or maybe even exceed with certain um, devices, right? depending on the product characteristics, which are regulatable. Um, and then if you reanalyze the data, you see opposing effects as an observational study. But if you're a daily user of a tank-style device that's more powerful and should, in theory, give more nicotine and maybe be more appealing, um, then you have increased odds of quitting. Um, but if you use sporadically and you use the Sigalike, which have lower power typically um, and less nicotine yield, you have reduced odds. So maybe that can explain. And so all those meta-analyses might be missing critical element here of uh, variation. Um, so I don't know if I have time for this, but I'm pretty excited about this model we developed. Um, basically, we're, we get to address, I'll send this, I'll send this paper um, to anyone who's interested. But the idea is, is that we want to test whether e-cigarettes are suitable motivational substitutes uh, for cigarettes. And so what you want is, A, you want them to suppress withdrawal, and you want them to suppress withdrawal not that much differently than traditional cigarettes, you know, if they're a smoker. B, you want them to suppress e-cigarettes to suppress smoking behavior and motivation to, to smoke, um, which you can model uh, using behavioral economic type task uh, we use from Cherry McKee. Um, and then you can flip it, and you can say, like, hey, when, you're, when you um, don't smoke, um, are you more motivated to vape? versus when you're not. Because we want them to reach for an e-cigarette when they're deprived rather than a cigarette. Um, and so, so here's some basically, really quickly, um, here's, so here's a bunch of withdrawal symptoms. And then this is the vaping-induced versus smoking-induced satiation effects. These were dual users. So this is like a proof. This is like a methodology um, analysis. I, uh, ultimately, you want to use this model for a number of different populations, including never vapors, to see whether certain products are better. Uh, motivational substitutes, but then, but you start with um, dual users because you assume that they they have some sort of baseline level of substitutability or, or appeal in this group, and the the point is is, is you know this is a small sample, um, there weren't really like striking differences in withdrawal suppression between their own device and their own cigarettes when they're overnight deprived um, from both products, besides carbon monoxide. <laughs> blood pressure and heart rate, and then your urge to um, smoke, um, which makes sense. Your urge to vape was no different. So these are actually abstinence, or they're satiation effects. These are like change scores, Cohen's Ds. And then so here's the model uh, task. Um, so vaping promotes ability to delay smoking for money, so you can wait if you get paid to smoke. Um, some people don't, some people do. But um, if you vape, it kind of reduces it, which we'd expect. Um, and then reduces the number of cigarettes you smoke. Once you uh, say, hey, I want to smoke my cigarette, um, you can pay for cigarettes. And then on this other part, oh, I guess I, did, I didn't um, include those um, graphs. But it does the same thing in the opposite direction. When you're deprived from cigarettes versus satiated from cigarettes, you're more motivated to vape, and you we developed a vaping behavioral economics type measure um, where people could purchase vaping episodes that were five minutes. Um, OK, so why might I uh, draw on youth, uh, the flavors? <coughs> um, why are they appealing? There's two kind of broad reasons. Um, one is like the constituents of the device and the pleasurable sensations. Maybe they mask the effects of nicotine, when any, any aversive effects, or maybe synergize with the pharmacological. And then there's everything else, like the marketing, your expectancies, like your friends saying, hey, you've got to try this flavor. Um, so then we did it in the lab where basically everything was controlled, double blind. 
we just kept on giving our participants the device and say, hey, try this. And we'd switch out the, um, the e-liquid. And they differed in nicotine and the flavor. Um, and these were young adult vapors. Um, three quarters of them were smokers, too. Uh, so uh, you know, basically, the sweet flavors uh, were more appealing, had a higher abuse liability, um, more motivating across a number of indicators. The not sweet, which is menthol and tobacco, were in the middle. And flavorless was the worst. And then if you just look at correlations, when you collapse amongst all the products, you see a strong correlation between perceived sweetness and appeal. And then there's the way uh, they're sold. Um, so that potentially, for, especially for local regulations, this is what a vape shop looks like. Um, and then, of course, the product design packaging is another potential influence. Um, nicotine concentration associates with smoking progression. So amongst, so the extent to which uh, e-cigarette use increases your risk of smoking, it's, um, the variation is explained by how, how the level of nicotine concentration you use. So nicotine is promoting progression of vaping and smoking, or not promoting, associated with that. All right, so, and then to kind of wrap up is that most of us know that the a current FDA framework is to try to transition smokers to non-combustible, lower harm products. Um, you know, with considering youth, but this is the major kind of change in policy uh, or strategy. And so, part it's a two-part strategy. It's like you reduce the nicotine level in combusted cigarettes. You know, thanks to the research that you've done and other people. And then um, we also want to regulate the flavors in tobacco products. And how do we do it? Because we we're, we're, we anticipate, I'm going to say we, maybe the federal government and um, some members of the academic community, that if you reduce the nicotine level and then you also allow competing non-combustible products, then um, you're going to get low rates of smoking uh, in the population. But then in the, in the flavors one, this uh, advance notice of proposed rulemaking by the FDA, they say, like, well, we're also concerned about youth. But then we also recognize that smokers like flavors um, who vape. So basically, if you can just study these regulatable reasons across the populations and like have a well-controlled design where you have both of them, which is what we're trying to do now, um, you give them the same manipulation, and then you show like, hey, it increases appeal in this group, and it doesn't have it doesn't affect appeal in this group. Um, and so even so, stuff like the um, uh, packaging and marketing, right? It could be the same e-liquid, but. If you took candy corn off the market, which is, they're kind of moving towards that direction recently. Um, uh, I, you may not like be like eliminating a lot of sm smoke. I really wanted that candy corn. You know, I can't have this whatever sweet blend two, number 265, I don't know. Um, and then so lastly, just basically disparities. So I talk about. One thing that happens a lot is that with, as policies change, like advantage groups quit or, and don't start smoking, and disadvantage groups don't. Um, and then you know, regulation could have the same effect. And so to the extent we, 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 we can look at how these play out across adults and kids um, who vary, we can maybe um, prognosticate whether a new product standard, for instance, or marketing restriction might further disparities um, or reduce them or have no effect. So this is just um, another ratio. But this is the ratio of SIG to e SIG use in the population. I took out some ones that didn't fit, that didn't show this disparity. Mental health didn't show this disparity. But, um, but yeah, you can see uh, higher uh, risk uh, ethnic groups, um, uh, less educated, less income. You know, there's less people who have switched, probably. Uh, yeah. So this is the end. Um, it's a blunt tool, regulation. You can you do it for the whole population, but you don't have to just think about it as like, oh, let's allow them and let's restrict them. And then um, regulatable product characteristics, maybe um, some of them do more harm than good. We can get rid of them. And uh, distinguishing heterogeneity. I think is really important, both in terms of the use outcomes, right? So it's like quit success or just quit attempts, and then um, the dimensions of the products. I'm not just saying flavors, but parts marketing and the constituents. And I don't know what to do about nicotine yield, flying the ointment. My colleague uh, coined that term. I think it's true. 
for E6. Okay, thank you so much. I went over, but. Yeah.